Thank you. We have two hour and 15 minute lectures in university, so I'm gonna do my best to condense. Um, thanks for being here. I wanted to talk today about some work we're doing, and um, the great thing about the work we do is it's not my work. Uh, we have students uh, and alumni sampling on the other side of this wall, so please um, stop by and check it out um, when they're done. What I want to focus today on is um, some of the work we're doing to move towards a new understanding of triple bottom line, a uh, new way of thinking about triple bottom line. So the classic triple bottom line is people, planet, and profits, right? And we all know that we've, it's um, a couple decades old, um, and there's certainly nothing wrong with it. A classic example would be um, fair trade shade-grown coffee, right? It's better for the environment. It, provides bird habitats, it uses less water. Um, we've learned that even though the yields are lower, um, the quality can be higher and people will pay a premium, right? Um, so it can provide a living wage for people who grow it, a family wage, um, and it can provide some, um, some revenue. So that's great. Um, but one of the things that we um, realized in doing our work was there's nothing necessarily inherently sustainable about the actual product, right? The product is the product. It's the way of doing business, right? So you can have a triple bottom line, you know, auto body shop, or you can have a triple bottom line um, chocolate um, plant. You could do just about anything with that model. So we've been really um, interested in how to make the actual food product itself have that sort of triple bottom line orientation, right? Looking at the sustainability of the actual food product, the healthfulness of the actual food product, and economic development, job creation, family wages. We've been focused on a lot of our work around um, a category we're calling VASP, also called upcycled foods, which is a little bit uh, more attractive than VASP. Um, but VASP, VASP stands for Value Added Surplus Products. So looking at where we already have food in the system, adding value to it, and keeping nutrition out of the trash can and into people. So I want to just tell some stories um, about how we've come to think along these lines, some of our successes, and some of them are actually here at the show. And if you ask nicely, uh, I'm sure our, um, our students and staff will allow you to, uh, to sample. So this, all of this work, and we have now um, a pretty extensive portfolio of products, um, all started with bananas. So I want to tell you the famous banana story. Um, the EPA has a program, uh, Drexel's in West Philadelphia, in West Philadelphia called the Food Recovery Challenge. And the idea of the Food Recovery Challenge is to keep food um, in the mouths of people and out of the compost bin and out of the trash can. Uh, many people feel virtuous about composting, and compost is certainly a good thing. We have Brooklyn Mompost, Annie Hauck here. Um, but all things considered, um, the EPA has something called the food recovery hierarchy, and compost is pretty down on that hierarchy. It starts with um, source reduction, producing uh, less surplus food, then feeding people, then feeding animals, then industrial uses like methane, biodigesters, then compost, which generates greenhouse gases, and still um, we have to think about all the inputs that go into that food that we're then composting, right? And then the absolute worst thing you could do with food is landfill it. So we've been really focused on keeping our food at the top of that food recovery hierarchy. So um, the food recovery challenge seeks to limit um, the amount of food that goes to the bottom of that pyramid in compost and landfill. And um, so they asked us to first uh, donate food to the Food Recovery Challenge and make sure that any excess food that we had um, would go to someone who needs it. It turns out culinary schools are very um, poor donors to um, surplus food recovery initiatives because if you're dealing with a couple hundred students, if you say, hey, there's a little bit of something left over, by the time you get that sentence out, it's, it's gone. Um, but we followed the food, and um, 
we went to one of the bigger donors in the program, which is a, a supermarket, a brown superstore in, uh, in West Philly. And we looked at how they were handling their surplus. And certain products, there's really no problem. Uh, their meat recovery is, is really phenomenal. On the day of the sell-by or the day before, they go through and freeze all the meat. Um, the food bank picks it up once a week. Its cold chain is kept. It's distributed frozen. It's defrosted used. No problem. Other products, like bananas, they aren't interested in. So the bananas get cold every morning when they start to turn brown, 10 AM. And the food bank doesn't want them, because by the time they get put, they have a re refrigerated truck. They don't have a tropical chain. They get, you know what happens when you put bananas in the fridge. Then they go to the warehouse. Then they're sorted. Then they're distributed. They're done. So um, all these EPA nerds and, and students came up with the, their laptops, and they figured out, OK, we can get this food to people who need it the day that it's cold from the supermarket shelves. So 10 AM, it's cold. You can drive up with your station wagon or your van. It's going to be on a buffet table in a soup kitchen or a shelter by noon. Great. Sounds great. So then we followed the food. We went to a shelter for women and children near the university. They have a great, a great chef, uh, former fine dining cook, who said, you know what? I'm sick of putting microgreens on plates with tweezers. I want to do some real cooking for real people. She makes beautiful chicken, rice, vegetables, salad. The end of the line is a big metal bowl of brown bananas, right? Harvested that morning from the supermarket. What do you think the uptake was on those brown bananas? Zero. It was better than zero, 10%. So our students, Allie, who's at the booth, she just walked by. I should have given her a shout out. Um, and some of our students, Dana, who's here, said, we can, we can fix this. So it was 10%. The supermarket has a composting program. They're a national leader in sustainability, that chain, right? The supermarket has money to pay for their trash service, right? The shelter does not have a composting program and does not have money to pay for the trash service. So with all good intentions, right, we have this shelter subsidizing big business, right? So um, our students said, we can make something and make 100% of the bananas donated to this shelter um, eaten. What do you think they made? Banana bread. Ban Everyone always says banana bread, and it's the absolute worst, worst answer. <laughs> Why is it the worst answer? Think about it. Right, if you make banana bread, you may use two bananas per loaf, roughly, right? So there's 25 women in the shelter. There's about 40 bananas in a case. Right? That's 20 loaves of banana bread. What else? No, but what, why else is banana bread bad? a bad idea? It's fattening. It's a sometimes food, as nutritionists say, right? Um, yeah, lots of sugar. And it costs more for the, those extra ingredients. I, I don't believe in banana bread that's not made without rum and chocolate. Um, so I don't think it's possible. So our students said, you know, what if we just make a banana ice cream, in quotes? It's one ingredient, bananas. You take it, you put it on sheet trays, you freeze it. You can mash it, you can food process it, you can do anything. You could add milk. Milk is another thing. These shelters, based on their guidelines, government guidelines, CACFP, they have to have eight ounces of milk per resident, per meal and snack. So they have five eight ounce portions of milk per day. 40 ounces of milk, It's a lot. Uh, no one, I don't think anyone in this room drinks that much milk. So you can add milk, you can add honey, you can do stuff, but it works with just bananas. What do you think our uptake was after that? 100%. More than that, the whole ethos of that environment changed, right? Now, instead of saying, here's, some, here's a bowl of brown bananas, enjoy, you have a teenager who's staying at the shelter scooping ice cream for the other kids and for the moms, right? So it was, it was this beautiful thing. All right, wonderful, adorable. Who's going to make money on this? Nobody. So it, do, it doesn't quite get to that triple bottom line, but it got us started. Smooth, someone mentioned smoothies. So it turns out you can make a smoothie base with just bananas and water. The same store that was donating bananas was buying a commercial smoothie base syrup 
which is just sugar and flavor, right, could be using bananas and then adding other fruit to it. So then we can kind of close the loop. We can start a microenterprise um, processing smoothies. The problem with doing um, recovery from supermarkets is boogers, right? <laughs> bananas are handled. People are gross, right? And they have boogers and all sorts of germs on their hands and they touch the apples and they touch the bananas and they touch all sorts of stuff. This is not really a sustainable business model. So we started moving up further up the food chain. Um, one of the things that we sampled, I think we have more if you want to try it, um, is this product from Baldor. Baldor makes fresh cut produce. They have lots of scraps. Uh, their trademark name is Sparks. Can anyone figure out why the brand is called Sparks? And they have lots of scraps. It's scrap spelled backwards. Well, people pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for branding consultants. Uh, you should talk to Thomas from Baldor. So they have this thing called Sparks. It's a dried vegetable blend. What's the question then? I can give you 3,000 pounds a day of dried vegetable blend. What's your question? So what? What do you do with it, right? So we formulated um, a muffin for the Boston Public Schools in partnership with a nonprofit called Commonwealth Kitchen. It's a muffin that has a full serving of vegetables. There was a, a little scandal in Boston last summer called Muffingate. A, um, a nutrition public health professor wrote an ed editorial in the Boston Globe that we're feeding our children um, cake for breakfast and calling it muffins and we're, we're destroying our, uh, our children. So they, um, Commonwealth Kitchen got a grant to make a healthier um, breakfast muffin, and we helped them formulate it so that it would have a ser full serving of vegetables with this powder. There's a problem with this story, which is we don't want the narrative of triple bottom line to be we have a lot of extra food and we're giving our le leftovers, the leftovers from people with means we're giving those leftovers to people without means and we're feeding poor people our trash, right? That's not the story we want to be telling. So I'm really excited about this product. This is a relish. I think it's really important. It's a chow chow, uh, but chow chow doesn't test well, so it's called relish. Um, and it's a mixed vegetable pickle. And that's important because it's still a relish if it has less cauliflower this week and it has more turnips next week, right? And so it, it's sensitive to changes in food supply. What's great about this, this is being made by two people, um, the food bank in Philadelphia, which is called Phil Abundance, and um, our hipster pickle maker called Brian, St Brian Street. Every town has a hipster pickle person. Um, ours is named PJ. And so they're making this relish. And what's cool about this relish is it sells for a dollar in Fair and Square, which is the supermarket of the food bank. And it sells for $7, $6.99, in our Hippy Dippy Co-op, right? So now we're really changing the conversation. We're saying there's a specialty food product that people will actually pay more for. And we have some research coming out that people will pay in between conventional prices and organic prices for upcycled food, which is relatively a new shift in thinking. The wisdom up until a couple years ago was people are gonna pay less, they'll, they'll buy surplus food, but they'll pay less for it. They won't pay organic prices, but they'll pay almost organic prices. And now we're starting to see things on the market. So uh, you may have seen Love Beets is here. They have a vegetable powder. It's made from their seconds, the beets that aren't pretty enough to go in those cooked, peeled um, beet packages. Uh, and we did some recipe work with them. So, you know, just to review triple bottom line, it's healthy, it's sensitive to surplus food, and it's profitable. So um, my uh, encouragement for specialty food producers is to think about opportunities, not just to do business in a sustainable way, but look at what's already being produced in the food system and find opportunities to do this new kind of triple bottom line. Thanks.